Yeah, that sounds like something that we all should be a part of. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and read verse 18. Uh, I mean, <laughs> verse 31 of chapter 18. Then he took the twelve. Uh, then he took the twelve aside and said to them. Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and all the things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Then it happened as he was coming near to Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging, and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who uh, were, were sent before him warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more and said, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood and, and commanded him to be brought to him. And when, he was, and when he had come near, he asked him, saying, what do, you want from, uh, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, uh, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. That's where we left off. And I encouraged you. You know, um, I was talking to to the youth especially about this. But, uh, you know, I was like, why do you think that Jesus asked him what you want? I mean, it's pretty obvious. He's a blind man. And he's sitting there saying, Jesus, have mercy on me. And, uh, you know, the kids, the kids had it. I mean, they're like, I think they just, they want to, he, he wanted him to have that relationship. He wanted him to talk to him. And I totally agree with that. You know, when Jesus says, what do you want from me? You know, and he told him, I, that's exactly what Jesus wanted to hear. And it's the same way with you guys, no matter how crazy and no matter if you think God doesn't care about it or, or one of these things that come in your mind, that's a lie. It's absolutely wrong because God wants to hear his name on your lips. He wants to hear, he's sitting there saying, what do you want from me? And the thing was, is what I loved about this blind man was the fact that, you know, he heard Jesus was coming and he begins to recognize Jesus for who he is, the son of God. And he says, Jesus. And people are like, hey, you know what? You need to be quiet. And he's like, Jesus, I need you. And what a blessing that is that he didn't just listen to the people and just let Jesus walk by without screaming his name out. And I, and I challenged us in this room that how many of us worry so much about the people around us or the things around us that we don't shout Jesus's name. We don't shout what we want from Jesus. We don't shout how beautiful and how wonderful he is and recognize him as our savior because there's people around that are telling us to be quiet. You know, and, and I, I challenged us, and we had an awesome just time of breakthrough last week um, or two weeks ago where everyone was just praying together, and we always have people over here and always people over here and people in the middle and people praying for each other. And that's what's amazing about Sunday nights. We have that open time where there's no time limit. We can do whatever we want. We could be here praying all night if we wanted to be. And that was what was amazing. We had tons of people praying. So now we get started on the new stuff, uh, chapter 19, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd for he was short of stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him for he was going to pass that way. And when uh, when Jesus came up to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he is also a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just love you and we thank you for how wonderful and how beautiful you are. Lord, we were here just because, Lord, just because you are, Lord, you are everything, Lord. Lord, we want to know more about you, Lord. We want to draw closer to you. So Holy Spirit, we just pray that you would just fall upon this room, Lord God, and that you would do something amazing, Lord, for the hearts that are in here that are hardened, Lord, don't know why they're here, um, wondering why their parents drag them here. Lord, I just pray that you would show them why they're here. 
Lord, for the hearts that, that um, have been here for years, and Lord, maybe it's become just a ritual to come to church. It's just what they do. Lord, I pray that once again, there would just be revival in their hearts. Lord, they would just cry out for you tonight, Lord God, that they would um, have an awesome meeting with you. And Lord, for the people, Lord, um, Lord, that just can't get enough of you, and that's why they're here. Lord, I pray that you would continue to be that for them, Lord, that they would just always just want and strive to have more of you. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would just work in an amazing way here, Lord God. And Lord, um, Lord, we just pray against any distraction or anything that comes against this, Lord God, that we have just victory here in Jesus' name. And so, Lord, we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So chapter 19, verse 1, let's look at that. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, because of his short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him for he was going to pass that way. So we see another predicament that we have here. We have a a man named Zacchaeus that we introduced him to you here. He was a tax collector. We found out he was short. Uh, He was a short man. But uh, basically, he already has the most hated job that you could possibly get in that time. And that's basically, he was taking money for the Romans from his own people, right? And not only that, he was rich, which meant like, let's say I had to, you know, if I was Zacchaeus, I had to charge you 20 bucks, I would charge you 35 bucks and take the 15, right? On top of what I was getting paid. So he was rich. So it's not that he was rich because he was a tax collector. He was rich because not only was he uh, the most hated position, he was also a dishonest most hated position. So, I mean, he's like a double whammy of just despised, right? He was a rich tax collector. He was dishonest. But you see another man here that is in the same predicament that we saw a few weeks ago, right? The rich young ruler. How do I inherit eternal life? Do you remember that? He asked Jesus that question, and Jesus answered back and said, you know, a bunch of commandments. He had the five, and he said, oh, you know, Lord, I've done all these since my youth. And, Lord, and Jesus said, okay, well, take all that you have and, and give it and follow me. And he couldn't do that, and he was sorrowful. Remember that guy? We're going to talk about him in a little bit. Anyways, we're on to this other man who's rich, and what's the problem with him? He's not fulfilled. He has money. He has what he needs. He has all the things that money can buy. And yet something was missing. And today it's the same exact way it is in Bible times as it is today that there's just something missing. Why? Because each and every one of you were created to worship. But the problem is you were created to worship something that's reciprocating back to you. That is this the Lord feeding you and saying, like, I love you. And then what's problem is we we must worship anything that comes our way, right? Some of us worship their car, some of us, of us worship sports, some of us worship music, some of us worship musicians, some of us worship actors, you name it. We'll worship all that stuff and we'll worship it. And it's never fulfilling. We worship money. I saw this funny little meme online, and it was basically a businessman with a briefcase, and he had this little wire coming over holding a dollar in front of him, and he's chasing it, and there's this open grave and he's about ready to fall into his death. He's just into an open grave. And that's the same way it is. People their whole life will chase after something and worship something, trying to fulfill that need. If I only had that car, if I only had that thing, and some of them never look to the one thing that can supply that for them. Zacchaeus is not that man. The rich young ruler was not that man. They both went to the right person. The problem with the rich young ruler, he didn't want to do what Jesus said and he went off his own way. Here's what we have with Zacchaeus. He's like, I have got to see Jesus, right? And what does it say about him? Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. He was rich, sought to see Jesus, but could not because of the crowd. So we see that his heart was in the right place. Even not knowing who Jesus was, his heart was in the right place. He wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to experience Jesus. Maybe today this is your first time here. You know, maybe today you have come to church for the first time because you have had everything that the world has had to offer you, whether it be in the form of drugs, alcohol, um, relationships, whatever it is. And someone told you you're invited and gave you a card and they're like, I'm going to give this thing a chance. Maybe that's you in here tonight. Maybe you are completely desperate and you're like, I need to know if you're real Lord. Well, then I'm telling you that you're in the right spot. And especially if you have that heart. 
I'll tell you, having that kind of heart, that teachable heart, is something that you, I mean, if you have that and you come and say, Lord, make yourself real to me, you need to hold on. Because he's going to do so. But, and I'm telling you, he can break through even if you don't have that heart. Even if you're jaded in here right now and going, what, what is this kid saying to me? I don't, I don't even need to listen to it. The Lord can still break through and do something awesome. But if you have that heart, man, it's fantastic. But I want you also to know that he didn't take no for an answer. You know, basically, <laughs> okay, I can't see Jesus. So what does he do? He makes a fool of himself. He climbs up a tree. People probably made fun of him. I know, you know, if if I climbed up a tree and uh, and I'm up in the tree, people would make fun of me. But picture like a little short guy that's like, okay, I'm going to climb up this tree just to see Jesus. He was going to do whatever. He was, yes, I'm rich. Yes, I'm short. But I'm not going to let pride or embarrassment hold me back, right? And maybe some of you in here said, you know, I'm going to go find Jesus. And so they were like, are you, are you crazy? You're going to go find Jesus? Maybe that's you in here tonight. Maybe against all odds, or when you first came to church against all odds, to all your friends' you know, dismay, you said, I'm coming to church, and I'm going to find Jesus. I mean, that's the kind of heart that we need to have. I mean, Jesus is always pursuing us, but when we soften our hearts to that point and say, here I am, Lord. It's amazing. I, I had a friend who was actually, um, um, he's the youth leader. Um, he was, I had something to do with putting him in charge of the youth. Hopefully that works out for you guys. Um, <laughs> his name's Steve, and he's an awesome person. But he's like, man, I really feel a heart for the youth. And we were, we were, we were a, you know, a, a small church of like 65 people. And I was like, okay. And he's like, yeah, so can, can I, can, how do I go about doing this? I said, well, let's meet and let's talk. And so I said, well, tell me how you came to the Lord. And it's so funny because the way he came to the Lord was he's listening to CSN, but not like most people listen to CSN. Most people listen to CSN as, um, you know, how can I learn more? You know, he would listen to CSN because he was so smart and he's an intellectual and he's an atheist and he's going to prove the Bible wrong, right? So he's listening on, he would have a drive. He's a teacher in jackpot, which is about an hour away or so. And so he would be driving every day, turning on CSN and, and taking mental notes about what Christians believe. So he could argue with them, right? So he would know what he was talking about. But, you know, every day driving an hour and just going, all right, let's pick this thing apart. The Lord begins to work on his heart. And uh, I, he said it was a while into it that he had been going to this, you know, this to teach these kids. And he said that he was driving one day and <laughs> the Lord was like, how long are we going to do this? I mean, you can't find anything. How long are we going to play this game? And he said that he pulled over, and there was a thing on, on, on to every man answer to accept the Lord into your heart. And he was like, I'm going to do it. So he accepts the Lord into his heart, drives back to, drives to the school, and he's like, at that point, I just knew I was a Christian. And I knew that from now on, CSN was going to be a different station for me, right? <laughs> But that's who he was. And I I want you to know that Jesus can even break through your hard heart. Even if you came in here with with all the walls up, Jesus can break them down. But I'm telling you, if you come in here with a teachable heart, if you're here because you know the world has nothing left to offer and you open up your heart to Jesus, you're about ready to have your life changed forever. As you pray, Lord, 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 make yourself real to me. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to separate myself from my friends. I'm going to climb that metaphorical tree in my life, and I'm going to see you. I promise you, Jesus is searching for you, and he's going to see you. Now, for Christians, you know, people of us that that have been Christians for a long time, um, there's a lot of us in here that fall into that. Um, But let me ask you, is your passion the same for Jesus as it was when you first came to him? Right? I mean, I, I can remember when, I, I mean, I have friends that were pastors, full on pastors that had a, a vision and a, and a zeal for the Lord. I mean, they were at all this, they would teach the youth or they would teach adults and they were, they were on fire for the Lord. And something happened along the way to where now they don't even go to church. They spend very little time with the Lord. And it's just easy to become complacent with your view of Jesus. It's, it's easy to say, I'm a pastor now, or I'm, I've been to church for five years now, so I've, I've learned it all, right? Instead of continuing to seek Jesus and c- continuing to go out of your way and to find the Lord and, and to pray to him and to read his word and to study and to let him continue to refine you and continue to burn the stuff out that's not supposed to be there and continue just to have you rooted in the word. 
But I'll tell you, a lot of times it's easy just to forget that part and just go, I'm saved anyways. So let's look and see what happens in verse 5. It says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Now, what a wonderful picture, right? We, we always picture in the story, Zacchaeus is the man seeking after the Lord, right? I mean, granted, he's the one that climbed up the tree. He's seeking the Lord. But who is really seeking who? Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus, right? Jesus was walking down. He noticed, you know, he's looking around, this guy up in the tree, and he knew. He says, you know, right there, he says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. I love how easy Jesus lines it up for us to receive him, right? I mean, really, how much of it really has anything to do with you? I mean, think about it. Even the faith that says, even the faith that you had when you came to the Lord is from him. Think about that for a second. But, but think about how easy he's made it to accept him. All Zacchaeus had to do was to come down off of the tree and basically that was it. He's, made, he's done everything. You know, he's about ready to go to the cross and die for everyone's sins. And that's what he did for everyone in here. His grace, his mercy was to go to that cross willingly and to die for you so you could have that relationship. He's paid everything, but now it's up to you what you're going to do with it. It's up to you whether you're going to accept it and and say, all right, Lord, like this is what I was looking for. I came to see Jesus. Right now there's this man telling me that Jesus is pursuing my heart. I feel something stirring. Am I going to accept that or am I going to walk out the door and say, well, nothing happened? Because that's the only thing that cannot be forgiven. Gerald's message today was awesome. Listen, if you're in here thinking, oh, you know, I've just done too much. I I just can't be forgiven. Then you're lying to yourself. Because you're here wanting to be forgiven. I I love the story he told this morning about an 80-year-old woman that came in and said, Pastor, I, I did the unpardonable sin years ago, and now I don't know what to do. And Gerald's like, no, you didn't. You're in here right now right? You're in here wanting to be forgiven. You're forgiven. And she carried that burden with her for years. For those of you that struggle with drugs or alcohol or anything else, anything else that he died for, he's asking you, why aren't you just giving it to me? It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing. It's just, it's just you giving it over to him. You have not done too much, right? There's not too much to give to the Lord. And, um, you know, I, I, one thing I loved about Jesus is when he's walking, he could have very much just walked by the short little tax collector man, right? He very much could have just said, that's a weirdo in a tree. I'm going to walk right past him. But did he choose to do that? No, he went right up to him. And even if he knew that there's going to be people around talking trash, as soon as he goes up to talk to this man, there's going to be the people, even, you know, the religious people are going to start, oh, what do you see who he's talking to? That guy's, you know, he's against the Jews and this and that. And Jesus just didn't care. Jesus came to save the ones that were lost. But shouldn't this be our own goal? Because we are, to call, we are called to follow Jesus, right? And Jesus' heart was to find the weirdo in the tree. That was Jesus' heart. Jesus' heart is to find the short little man that everyone hated in a tree. Shouldn't that be our goal? Shouldn't that be our heart? Shouldn't our heart be to reach out to the outcasts and the people that no one else wants to reach out for? And, or, and you know, it's one of those things, or do we just write off that they were created for hell? Well, they weren't chosen. They were created for hell. Let's just let them burn. You know, and I'll tell you, <laughs> My mom, she's, it seems like every time I have a story about her, she's here. Um, but she did, a, she did a Tuesday night study, and I was actually here for it. And she was talking about how, she, the same idea, you know, are we reaching out? Are we going out there? And she said, well, what about that girl out there that's, that works for that porn store? The girl that holds up the three X's and does this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> what about her? How many of us truthfully, right? (laughs) You're welcome. How many of us truthfully drive by that lady and just go, she's disgusting. (laughs) Quiet, right? Because there's some of you in here that have done that. That's disgusting. (laughs) 
how could she do that, right? And my mom challenged people and said, how many of you have reached out to her? (laughs) Right? All right. I got to say, though, a whole church reached out to her. After my mom shared that, she goes, listen, finally, in my heart, I just said, I can't, I can't be that person driving by and going, that's disgusting. How could you do that? She goes, I, I was guilty. She's like, and so I stopped that and I pulled over and I went up and talked to her. And I said, you know what? You're beautiful. And God has created you more than what you're selling yourself for. And when you want out of this job, if you ever do, I will help you find a job. Here's $20. Go get yourself something to drink from Starbucks. That woman was probably like, what just happened, right? (laughs) But little did she know that that was a pastor's wife who speaks to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women, a few hundred women, and then another hundred at night, and all these different people, and has this kind of, yeah, way of speaking. And then they all went, and they thought it was their turn, too, to go tell this lady. And so you'd drive by, and you'd see this church lady get out giving the porn lady you know, some money and saying, Jesus loves you, or a gift card, and saying, you know what? We'd love to see you at church. And I guarantee you that lady did not understand what was happening at that point. But listen, our heart should be moved and not disgusted. I mean, there's a lot of things to hate this man for. There's a lot of things to hate Zacchaeus for. But you know what? There's a lot of things to hate each and every one in this room for. And someone chose to reach out and invite you to church. Someone chose to reach out and to love you. And I'm telling you, if we were to just only reach out to the person that we feel comfortable with, there would be no one in this room. I'll tell you, too, there's another guy. Um, I just call him trench coat man, but my mom, you've probably seen him around town. My mom felt bad for him too. So he's this guy is my size and I'm not suggesting all ladies in this room, go out and talk to the biggest man you could find and give him a $20 bill. Just don't do that. But if the Lord's calling you, absolutely. So they called the called the Lord called my mom to go out and talk to him. So she sees him walking and what does he do? He, she gets out of the car. She walks up, you know what? Jesus loves you. And he's just like, yeah. And she's like, yeah. And you know what? We'd love to see you at church. And yeah, here's $20. She's like, I don't, I don't need your money. I'm not homeless. He's like, she's like, oh, I don't care. Here you go. And you know what? And Gerald's like in the back going, I'm going to go broke. No, it does. Uh, <laughs> no, but Jesus loves you. And, and at that point, the guy, I guarantee you, he went home going, what? I've never seen a Christian reach out to me. I've never seen someone come up to me and just tell me Jesus loves me. And especially like to buy me a coffee. Like that's weird. Right? But going above and beyond what we have to, to reach the, well, the lost is a, should be our number one goal as a Sunday night service, as well as a whole church. My wife, she's like a weird person magnet. Like, and I, and I mean that seriously, anybody that, that like has issues or has problems or, or, you know, one of those people that you would think, oh man, you know, they, they're attracted. They're like, Hey, you know, they talk to my wife and you know what? My wife's heart is stirred with compassion for these people. And sometimes I even find myself like, oh man, like, you know, here's another homeless guy, you know, what do I do? And it's like, my wife's like, we got to do something. And, and you know what? It convicts my heart. And you know what? You guys that are in here that are married, you guys can do amazing works together. Because when one's not compassionate, the other one is. And when one's not, the other one is. We and Audrey have both convicted each other after, you know, driving off and turning around and going back and buying the guy something to eat or going back and telling him about Jesus or one of these different things. But let us be stirred with that same compassion as that person that is hating life here is really going to be hating eternal life in hell. They don't know Jesus most of the time. And so let us reach out to these people. I mean, we have the tendency of, as humans, right? To who do we reach out to? The people we're comfortable around, right? We have the, the, which is great. Like, don't get me wrong. Reach out to your friends. Reach out to the people you're comfortable around. But it's, it's easy for us to get in the comfort zone of only reaching out to those people. You know, and Jesus already had people following him. And he wasn't only reaching out to those people. He was continuing to reach out to whoever he saw, whoever needed him. And so what do we see what happens at this point? It says, so he made haste and came down and received, and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has, got, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I gave half of my goods to the poor. And I have taken, if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restored four, uh, fourfold. So let's look in uh, between six and seven. Actually, it's between seven and eight. Um, 
Zacchaeus comes down, and, and in between there, it doesn't talk about it, but they had a dinner, right? They actually had this time where he came down, and it says, I'm going to stay at your house. So they came down, and he stayed and dined with him. And what happens when he saw Jesus? When he experienced Jesus' grace and mercy and forgiveness, everything else in his life paled in comparison. When you experience Jesus on that level, where you understand what Jesus has done for you, there, there's just instantly, well, well how, when you become a Christian, how do you understand you know, this and this? Well, it's, it, you can't explain it until you have had it. Until you experience Jesus and you just realize how much is, is, is everything else in the world to what you have with Jesus, you would never give it up. But he knew at that point that his life wasn't going to be the same. And... Um, Isn't it just like that, though? I mean, in our own lives? Were you guys, when, when you came to the Lord, were you guys just shocked that, that like, he cared about you? I know, I know growing up, and, and like, my testimony is kind of crazy, but, you know, I grew up in a Christian household my whole life. My mom and my dad, my dad's a pastor, and my mom's a pastor's wife. And, you know, it's very easy just to coast along with your Christianity, or I know God, but I don't really, you know, I'm not spending a lot of time with him. I don't really know him. I'm not really sold out for him, but I know God. And you see a lot of pastor's kids get into that rut, and they never get out of it, you know? And it's one of those things that the Lord made himself really, really real to me, um, when I was in high school and um, man, I'm telling you, it's like at that point I was like, man, me, like why me? And my life was completely changed. And basically at this point, I just want to ask you guys, do you guys still have that same heart? I mean, I brought that up early, but do you guys still have that same heart when you were first saved? That, that joy. Do you guys, maybe it's for some of you guys at a camp, right? I know a lot of people get saved at retreats. I know a lot of high schoolers get saved at youth camps and stuff like that. And when they come, man, they come down from the mountain and it's hilarious. So you see them, they're like, man, my school better be ready because I'm going to be on the street corner preaching Jesus. And they're like, they're French, like, yeah, we're all preach Jesus, you know? <laughs> same way with us at men's retreats. I mean, man, you hear some people, oh man, I just can't wait to go to work. And then what happens? It starts to fizzle out, starts to kind of die and they start getting in the routine again and right but who in our lives i mean has anything changed in your life because it should and you should remind yourself how much jesus loves you and that should guide you and that should motivate you every single day of your life i mean i want you to see something happen that happened here when he gave his heart to jesus basically he had a meeting with jesus right there in his house When he experienced Jesus, once again, everything paled in comparison. But I want you guys to see, did Jesus tell him to get rid of those things like he did with the rich young ruler? No. There's nowhere in it says that take all you have, you know, give half of it away to the poor, restore all the money. He just knew that there were things in his life that weren't going to work anymore if he was following the Lord. He knew in his heart that those ways of living dishonestly wasn't going to work with the new creation, that new life that he has found in Jesus. Man, I got something to, I got, the reason being is because Jesus's, Jesus's love is what changes people's lives. Listen, it's not you. It's, I mean, going out there and witnessing to people and things like that is great, but it's not you changing their life. It's us leading them to Jesus to, for him to change their life because they're going to experience that and that's what's going to change them. But listen, Jesus' love changes lives. I posted this thing on Facebook and I just wanted to get people's um, input on it. And so I'm going to read you some of them because some of them are just amazing. But basically the question I asked was, read in Luke 19 about Zacchaeus. And when he came down from the tree and he dined with Jesus, he gave up a lot of stuff, a lot of things that made him comfortable, but a lot of things that were dishonest. What in your life did did you get rid of that instantly when you came to the Lord, he just began to work in your heart and you knew right then and there that that life was no longer for you. He didn't have to tell you to get rid of it. You just knew as your new creation that those old clothes aren't going to fit anymore. You are something new. You are light. That is dark. And what was it? And so I have a couple to read from you <clears throat> that I got their, their true testimony stories here. <clears throat> it says, Christ loved me before I loved him. At first, it was the most painful experience I've ever walked. Today, I'm so thankful. And I'm married to a med student and clean for over five years. I let Christ use me as he sees fit, and my life has never been better. Um, this one really got me. I was hateful and resented um, that at an early age. And I was taking care of my alcoholic mother. 
mother who was supposed to be taking care of me to the point of where she uh, tried to commit uh, um, to the point to where she tried to commit suicide and I wanted her to and I left her shutting her in the room that she overdosed in exactly one week later I opened a Bible to Luke 12 22 through 34 where I heard God's voice telling me not to worry that I was his and immediately after reading I accepted Christ I needed a father I needed to know love I needed to walk in it I, I had been trying to drive out hate with hate, but hate can only be driven out by love. My relationship with my mother and with the people in my life immediately changed, like a switch lighting up a dark room. Everyone saw it. Experiencing the love of God is what changed me, and it's, and it's daily encounter that I pray that I'll never take for granted. Um, of course, we have the usual... Um, you know, drugs had to go, alcohol had to go. Um, but there's another one too that I thought was, uh, there's two more that I really liked. One of them said, feeling forgiven was the most amazing feeling. Hope was a foreign concept that Jesus gave me. That was just short and wonderful. Another one um, um, was from Dorothy. It says, I was a filthy rag stuck in the pit of drug addiction. I had to surrender everything. Then I found out how much Jesus loves me and that I am a new creation in Christ. And then she starts quoting off scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And in Christ, I am complete now. Amen. Right? And this one was from another guy at our church. It says, it was amazing. I knew instantly that things, uh, things that were in my life were not good for me. Uh, and the Holy Spirit came into my life and I stopped partying, lost all my friends because I could no longer do those things in front of my Lord. I literally seen life. I saw life from a different perspective. All of my pride was gone. Life was no longer about me. I had a deep desire to know him more. And I began to learn what is, uh, what it was to love others. One main event after I got saved was I kept beating myself up because I grew up in church and I really knew better. My excuses were no longer valid. One day I was uh, wallowing in my shame. I felt he said to me as, as though there was a finger on my chest, don't you try to tell me that the blood of my son is too weak and too anemic that it can't wash your sins away. It was at that moment that I truly experienced my father's love. He was really there and he knew and he was mindful of me. I I have not been the same. My desire for him is greater than anything this world has to offer and he is still working on me. Does that sound exactly like what just happened with Zacchaeus? experienced the Lord, knew that everything was going to change, began to give up stuff. And let me tell you, it's going to happen till his return because Jesus changes lives. I'm going to ask Travis to come up here. Um, Travis has an awesome story about when he came to the Lord and, and kind of where he was. And I have one more guy to share with you. And I just wanted just to bring these people up because, you know, these, I mean, Travis, is, Travis has been one of the people that served alongside ministry for me for, for a little while now and such a blessing to this church. And um, I just really wanted you guys to hear from somebody that, you know, just is, is average bearded man, you know? <laughs> He is absolutely one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, and, and his story is amazing. And um, so I want you guys just to hear what he has to say, and maybe he can speak to your own heart. Maybe it was your first time here, maybe one of those things, and the Lord is already beginning to, uh, to move right now. So go ahead and speak about it. All right. Thanks, BJ. Um, I'm going to pray real quick. Lord, I just thank you uh, that we're here tonight, Lord, that we can be here, and that you're here with us, Lord. And um, I know there's people in this room, Lord, that um, they're carrying stuff around with them, just like Zacchaeus was when you came down here. And uh, I know that that night, Lord, when you uh, had supper with Zacchaeus, that you freed him of all that. And I just pray, God, you would do it again tonight. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, my name's Travis, and uh, BJ asked me to share a little bit. And um, basically, when I was about 17 years old, uh, I went to uh, an outreach where these bodybuilders, uh, some of the older people will remember this, they used to rip these phone books in half, and it was like, back then it was super cool. I don't think I would even think about going to one now, but you know, things change, people do different things, right? And, uh, but I went to the outreach, and um, I heard the gospel, and at that point in time in my life, it was, um, things weren't really good for me, um, but it, it, it takes a long time to explain that, it's not what I'm doing tonight. But I, I accepted uh, Christ that night in my, my heart, I prayed and I received him. And then, um, you know, just like the, uh, the parable of the, of the seeds that, that land on the path and the birds come, and before they can grow, the birds steal them, and, you know, the word has no root. That was me. And then for the next 10 years of my life, um, I wasn't going to church at the time. and didn't, I probably had a Bible, but I wasn't reading it. You know, my life was sideways. And so I, I fell back into sin, and, you know, 10 years went by, and uh, 
you know, just a lot of, a lot of bad things happened to me and I did a lot of bad things to people and I was just a bad person. I was a horrible person. And, um, the time came where, uh, I found myself back in church again. Amen. You know, the Lord is faithful. Thank God he's faithful, you know, cause I'm worthless, <laughs> you know? And, um, basically what happened was, is, uh, through a series of events, um, which you wouldn't believe me if I told you, it all happened here at this church, and uh, God's hand was all over it. It's just a, one thing after another was amazing. And I ended up going to uh, one of the retreats um, a number of years back. And I remember at that retreat, um, I went up there with a, my heart was extremely hard and extremely heavy. And, you know, I, I was guilty. I felt guilty for all the wrong that I had done. And um, I just couldn't forgive myself. And I didn't forgive people around me. And, uh, like, that's not a good place to be. There was a root of bitterness that started to grow in my heart, and I, like, it was, it was rooted deep. And I went up to the retreat, and, uh, Gerald was up there teaching on Saturday night, and, um, God began to speak to me, and, you know, like I told BJ on Wednesday, I was sharing this with him, Gerald was up there, it was him in the body, it was Gerald in his body, but Jesus was inside speaking to me. There was no doubt about it. The Lord spoke to me through him, and he told me that he loved me. And that he, that he wanted to forgive me of everything that I had done. And he knew what it all was. And, I, you know, like, like BJ says, we're not going to lead people to the Lord. Or, or I mean, we're not going to change our hearts. We're just going to lead them to the Lord. And, man, I, that night, it was so powerful. Like, there is, there is awesome power in the Word of God. You know, we live in a, in a day where, you know, we're so, we're so techy and sc- screeny, Right? constantly staring at screens and whatever. And I think that dulls a lot of stuff down. But, uh, you know, God's word is living and true, and it's, it's unbelievably powerful. The person I was, it, you know, it's gone. Second Corinthians 5.17, right? Behold, we're a new creation. You know, all the old has passed away, and everything's become new. And um, <laughs> Annalise and Dorothy, that's their favorite verse. That's why I know that verse. But, uh, you know, when God freed me that night, um, there's one man that Jesus heals in the Bible, and he, and he puts mud on his eyes, and he washes them off, and he goes, what do you see? And the man looked around, and he goes, I see men walking around like trees. And the Lord did it again, and then he could see clearly. And that scripture speaks powerful to me, because um, that's how the Lord has worked in my heart. Uh, he's healed me slowly. It's probably because I'm so stubborn and, and prideful that um, if God just took everything away from me at once, I'd just fall down and you know, I'd be a mess. <laughs> so the Lord, he's a delicate surgeon. He's one thing at a time he's taken from me. And that night on the mountain, what he took from me was the guilt. The guilt and the unforgiveness that I was holding on to. And it freed me. I mean, it freed me. And I wish I could like let you guys all in my mind to understand like how passionate I am about that. Like God absolutely changed my heart that night. And, uh, you know, he just gave me a new life. And if anyone in here is struggling with anything like that, man, tonight is the night. Because God has a, an amazing plan. He wants to do it right now. You know, he's faithful. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's amazing. I mean, it, can you see the similarities of the same, same exact thing? You know, a man going to a retreat to seek after the Lord, but his heart was hard. And, and, and you know what? The Lord is faithful. And, and exactly, you know, the same thing. There were things instantly that the Lord spoke to him about, about things that had to go and, and things that, you know, came later. But instantly, he knew his life was changed forever. Next guy I want to bring up is Vance. <clears throat> Vance. Uh, man, it's, it, he's awesome, too. He's an awesome story, and he's going to tell you a little bit about it and uh, his ministry that he does here. So we'll give him a, a chance to share it. Um, but I also want to tell you real quick about my buddy Michael up here. Um, I called him and to, and to get a story from him. And man, he just, he had, so, I mean, if you want to hear what the Lord has done in someone's life, come talk to Michael. I mean, he just, boy, he will, he will, he will consume your time with his conversation. <laughs> he will take you, he will take you from when he was saved to, to where he's at now. And man, what an awesome story. Man, I, I've got to see, um, 
Just even before my eyes, I've only been here for about five years, but when he came here, even to the person he was, to the person he is, and the person that God's making him to be, it's just a little bit at a time, just chiseling it off, and what a blessing, and I think that we could go around this room, and like I said, Vance is going to share now, but I think that if we were to go around this room and to, and to let everyone come up here and share, we would all have that thing about how the Lord's continuing to work, and how the Lord spoke to you something, and you just felt that grace and mercy, so it's uh, my friend Vance. Thanks, BJ. How's everybody doing tonight? All right. Um, Let's start with prayer, huh? Lord Father, we just come before you right now, Lord, and I thank you for allowing me to come up here, Lord Father. I'm blessed to be here tonight, Lord Father. I'm blessed to be in your presence amongst all these fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. And Lord, I just ask that you speak through me, Lord Father, your will and your way, Lord Father. Lord, we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Well, my name is Vance. Um, I've been coming to this church for about five years, and... Before that, I was just a little hoodlum out in the streets. For about 19 years, I was using drugs, um, hard drugs, alcohol. And to go back even a little bit farther, I, um, I was born in L.A., in Whittier. My house was the party house. So it was really easy for me to get drugs. Even at eight years old, my parents were already telling me, hey, if you want some, come to us. We'll let you try it first before you go anywhere else. And uh, I never did, thank God. But it was around, so running and getting beers for people. Um, just being around the smoke and everything like that. So I started young at drinking, and um, that was about eight years of my life. Then we moved out here to the desert, and my parents were still doing the same thing. And about 13 years of age, I, um, my parents got divorced, and uh, I went off the deep end. And I just started using drugs really, really bad, really hard, running away, just doing what I wanted to do. I didn't know much about Christ at all. I knew nothing about him actually at all. My grandma tried to get me to go to church once or twice, but I wasn't having it at all. And uh, I beat a life sentence at 18, and that still didn't straighten me out. My parents tried to help me out. They tried to get me into a, a church. They tried to get me help through the, um, just the city, counseling, everything like that, and I wouldn't have it. And uh, let me see here. Um, it was just crazy. It was really, really crazy. Um, I got out in 2009. And this is where I came to the Lord. Um, I was just laying in bed one night, like Zacchaeus was up in the tree. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, you're going to church Nick, tomorrow morning. And uh, I was like, just tripping to myself, like thinking like, what the heck's going on here? You know what I mean? Not even, not even knowing the Lord or hearing about him from anybody or anything. And uh, the lady that was next to me, she, I was told her too. I was like, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to church. I'm calling my mom. And she looked at me like I was nuts. I mean, think about it. How, just get done getting high, sitting, laying in the bed, and sitting up saying, I'm going to church tomorrow. You know, I was like, I was, I was shocked myself, like, what, what's going on here? What's happening, you know? And, and the Lord totally came down and spoke to me. And, and I went with it, you know? I didn't run from it this time. I, I was like, okay, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? So I got up and I went the next morning. I called my mom. She picked me up. And uh, we went to another church. We tried that one out. We didn't like it. We came, went to another one. We tried that one out. We didn't like it. My mom was like, why don't we go to Joshua Springs? I've been hearing a lot about Joshua Springs. My mom's been up here. She was a teacher for a while. Uh, she's worked at State of Bush. She's well known up here for a while. And uh, it was just real, real crazy. I walked into this church, and I was like, this is a huge church. I had no idea. I knew a lot of people there. People were like, hey, Vance, hey, Vance, hey, Vance. I'm like, well, kind of like, I felt very, very uncomfortable. Really, really uncomfortable. I was in clothes that were way too big to me, probably like three times the size too big. My eyes were all black around, I had rings, and uh, it was a blessing, though. I walked in, and the church was very welcoming. People were like, hey, how you doing? Welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Um, what's your name? Where are you from? What's going on? And uh, from that time on, I- I've been here for five years, and uh, the Lord has moved amazing in my life. Um, Amazing. Uh, I've got to work at the church for about a year. I've been in the ministry. I've uh, taught the fifth graders for a year. And all this was just a, a, just a stepping stone for me. You know, um, this was my biggest fear right here, coming up here and speaking in front of a church. I ran from it for five years. I would not do it. Um, I went to uh, the men's most excellent way, free from bondage, for about five years with Dave Rose. Um, he helped me a lot. He got me Help me right here to where I am at today. And uh, during all that, I've seen 
my life changed so much and so drastically just by saying yes and being willing and wanting to, to help and, and help other people. And during that time, I met my wife. Um, I've gotten my license back. I've gotten custody of one of my kids. Um, me and my wife got married. We got baptized before we got married. And uh, it's just been an, an amazing ride. Um, there's a lot of things I can't tell you guys. You know, I mean, I don't have that much time up here. Um, Monday nights, there's a class called Free From Bondage, the most excellent way. Um, Dave Rose left. He, was, he ran the class for eight years. And I've been blessed to be able to uh, ask to take over the class and uh, teach there. So now I doing this right here for with BJ and getting some more practice and getting up in front of people and, and sharing and speaking and uh, I'm as nervous as heck right now and I got <laughs> cotton mouth like crazy but um, it's okay. Um, for anybody that's new here tonight or hasn't been here, the Lord is awesome. He will work wonders in your life if you just surrender your life over to him and accept him into your life. Um, thanks BJ. Let's pray, for, let's pray for Vance. Dear Lord, I thank you for Vance and Lord for um, him stepping up for the Free From Bondage ministry, Lord, and just pray you'd bless him, Lord, and, and continue to speak through him. And, and Lord, thank you for the other stories we've heard here as well, Lord God, and the people that you've changed by your love. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's crazy. Um, just when I came up to him, uh, I don't know why. The Lord's like, go, go talk to Vance. Get Vance's story. And so I went up to Vance, and he, he's like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. And so I walk over, and he's like, and I'm like, hey, so tell me, you know, here's what's going on. I told him the Zacchaeus thing. I was like, and, and tell me how, you know, how would you come to the Lord? And what did he tell you? Sit down. Sit down. So I sit down. He's like, it's really weird. And so he's telling me, I'm like, hey, you want to share that on Sunday night? Oh. Uh, oh. Uh. And then he's like, you know what? No. No, I will do it. Not tonight, right? I'm like, no, on Sunday. He's like, okay, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. And, uh, man, you can just tell, like, God's doing something. And Travis, man, his, his, his story is awesome as well. And I'm sure all you guys have a story of when he came to the Lord and how amazing that is. And I want you guys to follow with me in here. And 9 and 10, and it says, And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he is also a son of Abraham. And it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save which was lost. How amazing is that, that that is what the Son of Man has come to do. That is what Jesus has come to do, to seek and save which is lost. And I love how much that that everyone around did not want to see that person be called a son of Abraham. The Jews did not like that some man, some some short little tax collector, rich, ripping off, dishonest man, would be called the son of Abraham. But God came to save those that need help. And I want you guys to see something. You know, we kind of left off with um, the rich young ruler. Back up with me real fast. I want want you guys to see the contrast. It says right here in verse 22 of chapter 18. So when when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard this, he he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that, he became very sorrowful and said, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And then uh, those who heard it said, who then can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. You see the tax collector, the rich tax collector. It's possible with God. You see the recovering drug addict, the, the man that had nothing, and then he gave his heart to the Lord. All things are possible with God. You see the religious people that, that never really had a relationship. They just had a lot of knowledge and a lot of different things, and then all of a sudden the Lord saves them, and their life is drastically changed. All things are possible with God. You see the people that have come to all sorts of addictions and all sorts of hate and all sorts of bitterness and pain that they've been carrying around. All things are possible with God. So that story actually ends happy because we see a picture. I, I think it's on purpose too. I mean, Jesus shows us a picture right after of a rich man that can be saved because of God. So I want you guys to know whether you've been in this room uh, and been in this church for years or whether this is your first time here, let's just go to the Lord right now. 
I'm going to pray. I'm going to have the worship team come back up. We're going to have people over here praying. We're going to have people over here praying. There's going to be people in the middle praying and pray with the person next to you. But let's just go to the Lord wherever you're at right now in your life. Whatever you, whatever you have, you know, just come, just climb up on that tree and say, Lord, here I am. Speak to me. Work in my heart. Give me that passion again. Lord, come into my heart. Maybe it's your first time. And if it is, come up and talk to me. Come up and talk to one of the guys that just shared if you feel more comfortable. Just say, man, I just accepted Jesus into my life. Let us come alongside and love you and, and hold you up and, and, and bear your burdens with you and all these different things. I mean, we're, you're, we're a family here as a body of believers. That's the best thing. I mean, it's so great that instantly you have this, this, this relationship with someone because the spirit within them is, is communicating with the spirit within you. It's amazing. It's all Jesus. We're under one banner, and that's the best part about it. So let's just go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer.